live webinar, 9-11, An Architect's Guide, a three-part series. Today is Thursday, August 15th, 2019. I'm Richard Gage, AIA, member of the American Institute of Architects and founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization representing a growing body of now more than 3,150 architects and engineers. We're all signed on to the petition demanding a new investigation of the destruction of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers on 9-11. This is part one, World Trade Center Building 7. It's about the third tower, a 47-story high-rise that collapsed suddenly and symmetrically into its own footprint in under seven seconds at 5.20 in the afternoon on September 11th, 2001. Before we go further, let me introduce you to our operations manager, Andy Steele. Hey, Andy. Hello, Richard. Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, just to let everyone know, I'm here to help with any technical glitches, which do occur from time to time. And also, we'll be happy to take questions at the end of the course. You just submit them in the questions and information form online at ae911truth.org. So with that said, back to you, Richard. Thanks so much, Andy. And uh, just so people know something about my background, I was responsible uh, for the uh, in a local Bay Area firm here in the San Francisco Bay Area for the construction documents for these three and $10 million gymnasiums, construction administration for this $125 million high school. And more recently, before launching full time onto this important outreach effort, I had similar responsibilities working on this $400 million mixed use project near Las Vegas with six blocks of retail, mid-rise office space and parking structure, altogether about 1200 tons of fireproof steel framing. I now work full-time educating architects, engineers, and others to understand what really happened at the World Trade Center using the material in these courses. About it. You know, most architects and engineers oh, Richard, you cut out on us. So you may want to start again and check your microphone. All right, folks, it appears we've lost Richard. Um, if you can still hear him, let me know because I am not hearing him. But uh, we're just going to work out the technical glitch, which we talked about at the beginning of this program, happens from time to time. And uh, just be patient, and hopefully this will be worked out in just a few moments. All right, folks, I think that the glitch is happening on Richard's end there. So I got to figure out what is going on. Uh, so please right, stay folks, tuned. I think that and, the glitch uh, is happening the on Richard's Reverb for me there. We'll mute that. Uh, so please stay tuned. And uh, we're trying to get these webinars relaunched. We're using some new systems today to avoid these glitches, but it appears that we're having more of them. So again, uh, just be patient and hopefully we'll be back in just a moment.
All right, Richard's internet apparently went out. So he's in the process of getting that back online. I just spoke to him. He's very confident he will be back. And so I just want you guys to stay. And uh, I can actually see the slide now. So it appears Richard is back. Are you back, Richard? How about that? Um, yep, sometimes the internet goes out here. Um, and um, we'll be having words with our ISPE. Uh, I was asking everybody, um, let's get, yeah, everybody's, uh, everybody's on the stream. I was um, asking you if, if you knew about Building 7 because most architects don't even know about the third worst structural failure in modern history. Uh, an incredible fact that's verified every time we go out to the uh, AIA conferences, American Institute of Architects and Engineering conferences. It's just shocking. How many people don't know about the collapse of this building? We show it to them and they say, oh my God, uh, I know what that looks like. Uh, and you'll be seeing it here in a minute. Uh, and uh, they say, well, when did that happen? We go, well, uh, as a matter of fact, it, it happened on 9-11. Well, that doesn't look like a twin tower to me. No, it's only half the height of the twin towers. They went down in the morning. This building comes down at five o'clock in the after, 520 in the afternoon, 47 stories tall the tallest building in 26 of our states. Emery Roth and Sons was the architect, structural engineer, Irwin Cantor. It's part of the World Trade Center complex. Now, it wasn't hit by an airplane. Well, how did it go down uh, if it wasn't hit by an airplane? We're going to be looking at this today. It's about 110 yards uh, north of the North Tower. Uh, so um, here it is, in fact, surviving just fine. Uh, after being hit uh, by a few of the beams from the Twin Towers, North Tower, when it went down, it's uh, it's uh, standing fine. There was some damage, according to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain to the American people the collapse of these three World Trade Center skyscrapers on 9-11. They say, well, the damage wasn't a part of it. And... Uh, Diesel fires weren't a part of it. Let's see this, what happened to this building. Take a look at this. Uh, 5.20 in the afternoon, seven hours after the towers went down, the East Penthouse collapses, and then the West Penthouse and screen wall collapse, and then the whole thing comes down. Now, we're going to go into some detail on this, but I wanted you to get that initial view. Uh, let's first listen to Sham Sunder of NIST. Explain this to the American people. Fires. Well, these are the fires that were in the building. Um, normal office fires uh, is what they say. Um, so uh, these are the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of uh, in these buildings. So now we know what we're looking at, uh, these fires. In fact, um, on the east side, uh, the 12th floor uh, and 11th floor, these fires are burning at 2.30 in the afternoon, but they begin to move over. Even by three o'clock, they're halfway over to the west side. And this is important uh, because NIST says that those fires were burning under this east penthouse down about the 12th floor. Uh, ferociously at the time of the collapse. We're going to look and see if that's true. And because the East Penthouse comes down first, as you saw, uh, they focus their attention on this column number 79 here. In this report, the final report on the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7, which came out seven years later, after everybody forgot about this building, if in fact they ever knew. So NIST's um, analysis here focuses on the fires uh, in on the east side on the 12th floor. And they suggest that those fires uh, were burning uh, around column 79 for an hour, at least an hour before the collapse and during the collapse. Is that true? Let's look in more detail at these fires. And by the way, they contradict themselves because they acknowledge what 
every fire protection engineer acknowledges that fires don't exist or persist in any one location for more than about 20 or 30 minutes. Yet here they are uh, persisting for an hour and a half in their computer simulation uh, because they need to make those fires very hot in order to do what they're going to say, what they have said there that was done to the, that steel in that area. But the photographs show that these fires were burned out on the 12th floor before an hour and a half, uh, be, an hour and a half before the collapse of this building, 350 here. No fires on this on, in this area. So how could they be persisting? As they say over here on the right side, their analysis. On the left side, our analysis, which is more consistent with the photographs, which shows these fires burning at about three o'clock in this area, and then having moved on, as the photographs show, over to the west. Leaving this area for an hour and a half uh, unburning around column 79. Unburning, not burning. Uh, so let's go on and continue with the official story here from Sham Sunder, the, co the, the lead engineer for this project. Uh, Richard, we can't hear the audio. All of a sudden, you can't hear the audio, Andy? Well, actually, it. Uh, oh, it, I know what happened last time. It's the, I think it's yep. a little checkbox. Yep, that's the checkbox. You're absolutely right. You you might even have to remind me of s such things. Um, let's reshare and bring up the screen, share it, and remember to click that checkbox. Oops, didn't see the checkbox that time. Let's try that again. Share screen. Share screen. Growing pains with new software, everyone. Here we go. You got to click the checkbox before clicking Sham Sunder. And here we go. You'll be able to hear the video now. Thanks, Andy. Appreciate all of that. And here we go. Structure. For the first time, we have shown that fire can induce a progressive collapse. For the first time, we have shown that fire can produce. So normal office fires. And you can see well, let's go on. on the screen, the column at the very right is column 79. And that's the column that first buckles, causing the floors to come down, followed by a quick succession of failures of adjoining columns. So they sure created a mess of that building in their computer model. Uh, we're going to be comparing that to the actual collapse, but let me first show you what happens here. We have <clears throat> in the official story that fire burning in this area for an hour and a half, which we saw the photographs couldn't have allowed, but let's say it was. Uh, that What they say is that these long span beams are pushing, because of those fires, pushing this girder off of its seat on this column 79, uh, which allows... Uh, this girder to fall and the floor 13 with it onto 12, 12 on 11, 11 on 10, and so on for nine floors, allowing uh, or causing uh, column 79 to be unbraced uh, for <clears throat> nine floors. And then the, the it fall, it collapses, causing the entire vertical collapse that you just saw in their computer model all the way up to the East Penthouse is what they claim. <clears throat> and uh, then this instability travels laterally across this football-sized building in about 10 seconds or so. Um, so, uh, and then that guts the entire inside of the building, uh, and then the overall shell collapses, as you saw. Now, every one of these steps has uh, impossibilities associated with it. Uh, one of which is that this, these these steel f f uh, members are fireproofed. They're not going to be heating up, even if there was a fire here, um, <clears throat> to the point where they would expand, uh, pushing this girder off of its seat. Uh, but even if they could have, this girder couldn't have been pushed off of its seat because the construction drawings show that there were 30 shear studs along the top of this girder tying it into the concrete slab 
very securely. It's not going to be pushed anywhere. Um, but they ignore those. And then, uh, uh, in fact, they claim they weren't there, actually. But the construction documents show that they were installed. And then uh, the uh, even if that could have happened, there's not enough uh, distance across these beams to push this girder off of its seat uh, through thermal expansion. Uh, it can only push it halfway across its seat due to the thermal expansion coefficient of heated steel. Uh, so NIST says, well, that didn't have to happen. It only had to be pushed halfway across its seat, at which point this lower flange folds up after it's halfway across its seat. Well, that couldn't have happened either because there's another structural component uh, in this building called stiffeners that are three quarter inch thick that keep this lower flange of this girder from bending anywhere. It is directly over the bearing point uh, of the girder. So it had to be pushed, in fact, all the way off of its seat uh, for NIST's theory uh, to be to be uh, workable. So um, what happens, even if that could have happened, we wouldn't have had, and this girder did fall off of its seat, we wouldn't have had floor 13 falling on 12 because there are two other massive girders tied into this column. Uh, so uh, it'd be unlikely that this girder could even uh, fall anywhere, even after it was off of its seat, uh, not all the way down to the floor, and certainly not causing a shear failure of the girder underneath, which is uh, just as massive as this one, all three girders underneath, just as massive as, as this one. So uh, that couldn't happen, but let's say it did, and this girder caused that failure. <clears throat> and uh, we would have had uh, a cascading internal failure. Well, if that was true, we would have seen uh, these beams pull in on the exterior frame, causing massive deformation of the exterior structural steel perimeter framing system, uh, along with the stone, the granite cladding, uh, breaking up in massive deformations, not unlike a, a beer can crumpling and massive uh, br uh, breakage of, of glass across entire faces of these, this uh, building. Uh, but we don't see any of that in the videos, and we'll be looking at them again. Uh, so uh, we have, in fact, uh, consulted with the University of Alaska, one of the top uh, forensic structural engineers in the country, Leroy Hulsey, has been engaged for four years now on a uh, finite element analysis uh, study of this building, the analysis that NIST was tasked to do by Congress, but it, which as we've already seen has failed miserably. And they um, have uh, uh, proven uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that fire could not have brought this building down. That uh, study is in its final phases and uh, it will be released on September 4th, I believe it is, uh, with a uh, presentation by Professor Halsey at the University of Alaska and in Berkeley, California on September 5th. Um, he has proven uh, in all of these documents, uh, in, for instance, this being the girder failure, um, uh, even if that girder did fail, it uh, couldn't have caused the floor below to fail because it would have required um, uh, uh, 632,000 pounds of force to, to cause that shear failure. But it, it can only generate, even if it did hit the lower floor, 166, about 25% uh, uh, of that. Now, they also show NIST's uh, actual fraud in many cases. For instance, this simulation to try to cause a failure in their building due to fire, they notch all these beams and cause them all to fail at once because the building comes down at once. So they're trying to mimic uh, what happens in the building. But watch their computer model. Uh, according to Sean Sunder, it matches fairly well, but let's see. Here's our structural model showing the building collapsing, which matches quite, 
quite well with the video of the event. East Penthouse collapses first, and then an entire east side, and then that travels over to the west, but that's all they show us. There's two seconds. Let's compare it to the video. East Penthouse, okay, it collapses first. Uh, how do they get that to happen? But the massive failure uh, you see on the computer model is not seen on the left side of the... So they've got something else going on uh, here, which is causing, in fact, the failure of 400 structural steel connections per second, which is also causing uh, this building to tip over, which uh, the, the actual computer model tipping over. The building doesn't do that. Uh, in fact, they stop it after two seconds because it begins to tip over and look nothing like. So after seven years of computer modeling, NIST can't even get it to look like the uh, Building 7. But uh, uh, Professor Halsey has, uh, by gosh, he finds if you take out all the columns uh, in, in, in Professor Halsey's computer model, the, the computer model comes symmetrically, uniformly straight down, just like the uh, Building 7 does in the video. So <clears throat> we're going to find out what can cause that by using the scientific method. We have a question. How did the co building collapse? We do background research. How have other buildings collapsed? Make observations. Construct a hypothesis. That's our best guess as to how the building collapsed. Did it fire? Maybe controlled demolition. Actually, it looks like just like the old hotels in Las Vegas uh, when they uh, when they bring them down. Uh, we make some predictions based on these hypotheses and test those predictions with experiments. If this is true, you know, what follows from that? Analyze the results, draw conclusions. If the hypothesis is corroborated, we report the results in an open, transparent manner so all can build on the body of our work. We don't hide these, uh, for instance, the computer data, our input, uh, our assumptions from the public, as NIST has done. Uh, because we actually asked them for those computer data and they actually denied uh, us saying, well, it might uh, jeopardize public safety if we were to release these this data. Wait a minute. Doesn't it jeopardize public safety, safety to withhold this information from the architects and engineers who are tasked with ensuring the public safety? Doesn't make sense at all unless you're trying to hide something. So if your hypothesis is not corroborated, as NIST's is not, you go back, you construct a hypothesis that is corroborated until you have one that is supported by the evidence experiments, <clears throat> et cetera. That's what we're about today, starting with a review of the forces that have destroyed buildings. Fire's certainly one of them. It's certainly collapsed uh, some buildings, not ever before 9-11 high-rise fires, uh, high-rise buildings. But uh, say in the wood frame building, we, we, we would have an organic uh, chaotic process following the laws of entropy where there's uh, 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 increasing disintegration of order, uh, burning out an area in, as we've mentioned, roughly 20 minutes or so. Moving on, looking for fresh new combustibles. You know, that's all the fuel there is in a given area. So wood frame buildings uh, would fall over to the path of least resistance in stages. Uh, and uh, how about uh, steel frame buildings? Well, we've had the largest study of its kind, an eight-story building in the Cardington, UK. And... Uh, we're going to show you that video next time around because uh, we're not we're not on Google Hangouts, which has uh, uh, forced us to uh, not stream that particular video due to copyright violations. But um, we're, uh, we're we're going to try it again. Anyway, um, you can Google this. It's fascinating. Uh, th this particular report uh, shows that even buildings this building was eight stories it was built to be burned down find out what happened 
right? Steel frame building, some of which is fireproofed, some of which, as you see, is not fireproofed at all. None of which failed. I mean, there's just some bending, as you see here, of the columns. There's some sagging. Uh, but Jonathan Barnett says, uh, no, we've never had a high rise building collapse due to fire. Uh, and uh, and this look at all the fuel in this building. 2,000 degree fires they set with this massive fuel load of kindling stacked up to the ceiling and so forth. And still no collapse, just sagging uh, beams. Even non-fireproofed beams aren't failing. It's inherently stable steel frame due to the highly redundant nature of the structural form. So this is incredibly an important precedent uh, to be brought front and center, which sheds light on Building 7, because remember, Building 7 was not hit by an airplane. Building 7 did not have lightweight trusses. Building 7 had steel beams like you see here. And even so, uh, not even in Los Angeles, burning three and a half hours over five floors in the interstate, first interstate building, no collapse. Philadelphia, burning 18 hours over eight floors, no collapse. Caracas, Venezuela, 17 hours over 26 floors, no collapse. These buildings don't collapse. We'll find out why. Not even in China, where you have uh, this building completely gutted uh, in Beijing in 2009. Uh, from uh, top to bottom, complete conflagration. Any collapse? No. Before on the left, after on the right, slightly toasted around the edges, put back into use, remodeled, used today. How about buildings that collapse due to natural causes, not fire, uh, like in this case, earthquakes? These buildings, you don't have when these buildings collapse. Uh, uh, you, well, what you see is the building relatively you know in it's it's busted up but it's massing is their massing is intact the, every column and every beam is not severed one from another the concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder all which of which are features that we see in the collapse of building 7 now these buildings did explode we have thick billowing enormous pyroclast like clouds of expanding hot gases and pulverized building materials uh, uh, and, and incredible heat produced by the chemical reactions from the explosives. Um, we have sounds of explosions that are heard by witnesses. We have uh, these clouds that are expanding in cauliflower shaped forms um, uh, caused by these increasing uh, 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 hot gases, uh, flashes of light seen by witnesses. If you have these features, you know you have explosions. Now, those features can be harnessed quite effectively. Uh, the explosions uh, is what I mean. Um, in controlled demolitions, like the old hotels that you've seen in Las Vegas, and like this building, where trained professionals, engineers and explosives loaders, uh, engineer and uh, load sh uh, shaped cutter charges throughout the columns and beams in the buildings, thousands of them. And they're set off in a very precise order, usually starting with the bottom and then up, but they can do be done any number of ways. Uh, it's quite an art and it reduces, it, it, it reveals a, a set of features associated with controlled demolition. One, there's a sudden onset of the destruction, you know, not like a, a normal natural collapse. It's very sudden and often near the base of the structure, as we mentioned. Um, feature number two, a straight down symmetrical collapse. If that's what they want to do, they can drop it to one side or another also, and often into the center of the building's footprint. Um, there's th That happens because there's a patterned removal of column supports. At, with precise timing that allows them to drop that building wherever they want. A feature number four, uh, the building then falls, it accelerates straight down through the path of what was the greatest resistance, the thousands of tons of structural steel in these buildings, resulting in the total dismemberment of the structural steel frame. So it's a nice, neat pile, not a uh, huge massing of building. Uh, 
and then limited damage to adjacent structures, feature number six, one of the goals of a controlled demolition. Uh, pa patterned explosions um, heard and seen by witnesses. Um, and uh, that's a pretty obvious feature of uh, controlled demolition, flashes of light. A broken up concrete floors. You don't want to have to go in there with jackhammers later on. You want the explosives to do that work. Uh, so they're, they're, uh, you, you just don't have a lot of, you know, these, are, these are broken down to small pieces, or as we'll see with regard to Building 7, powder. Uh, feature number five, explosive charges left behind in the aftermath. Um, well, these are visible charges, actually, uh, called squibs, or isolated explosive ejections occurring uh, throughout the building, uh, sometimes obviously timed, um, but always obviously explosions. We'll be looking at those. Chemical evidence left behind, of course, in the, in the uh, piles of the explosive devices themselves. If you have all these features, guess what? You have direct evidence of destruction with explosives. None of these are created by fire. Not any of them. Fires cause structures to collapse asymmetrically, with gradual deformations, following the path of least resistance, and don't leave behind all of these other chemical residues that we're going to be looking at today. Government documentation with, uh, this is all now additional circumstantial corroborative evidence that can be very helpful in determining proof of a controlled demolition uh, for knowledge. Uh, especially if you don't just bring down these buildings in a day or an afternoon, it takes months to engineer and plan these. Um, and so people know about it in advance, which we'll be looking at uh, evidence of with regard to Building 7 today too. Experts agreeing, hey, that's a controlled demolition. Uh, at least those experts that are not uh, swayed uh, from an objective opinion by financial and political considerations. Uh, such as most all of the controlled demolition companies in the United States, which get their work from federal sources, typically. And video documentation, all this can be proof of controlled demolition. With that in mind, let's turn our attention to Building 7 and see, is there any of these features in Building 7, such as a sudden onset of destruction? And where? near the base of the structure. Let's take a look. Let's listen to Dan Rather narrate this view. And what you're seeing are high shots. There's the now, east. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Well, we haven't heard that phrase from Dan rather after 9-11. In fact, we haven't even seen this building's collapse on mainstream media with two or three exceptions. It is if it's been wiped from the map. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Well, let's watch from West Street. Uh, pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. Fascinating. Um, and watch the main penthouse and screen wall, the West penthouse and screen wall, collapse a half a second prior to the overall building. Now, wait a minute. NIST says, that the collapse started east, because the east penthouse has already collapsed here six seconds earlier, and proceed for the which is left side and proceeds west in about 10 seconds or so. But what we see is the uniform drop of the entire center structure, which is over the core columns. So they had to all be taken out at once. This is not a east to west progression. Uh, this is virtually at once, and then the entire building comes down. So NIST has painted a picture 
in their theory that does not match the videos yet again. And it falls into its own footprint, uh, almost. The center of the building uh, pile is in the center of the uh, footprint of the building. Uh, <clears throat> and we don't have large sections of building in, intact. Um, we, we don't have 47 stories uh, uh, floors uh, stacked up. Um, we don't have large sections of, of uh, columns remaining intact with uh, beams attached to them. Let's compare. Building 7 on the left, a known controlled demolition on the right. Is there any similarity? Hey, is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since it looks exactly like any one of these controlled demolitions. Especially since fire, the official cause of this building's collapse, has never brought down a skyscraper before 9-11. Should it not have been the first hypothesis, if not the only serious one, to be examined? But no, the controlled demolition hypothesis was only reacted to by NIST after questioners brought it up on their list of, <coughs> which they included on their frequently asked questions page on their website, put up years after the report came out, which was already seven years after. 9-11. Yet these few small random fires brought down a skyscraper symmetrically. Are you buying this? I mean, just intuitively. I mean, just think about this. This is not PhD stuff, we're, but we're only beginning. Feature number three, the pattern removal of column supports. How do you bring down a building symmetrically? Well, you have to remove all the core columns and the perimeter columns virtually at once on each of at least eight floors, as you'll see in a moment, to match the freefall acceleration that NIST eventually acknowledged. Does fire have this level of precision? No. Fire is an organic, chaotic process. Yet these few small scattered fires brought the building down symmetrically. How fast is the building coming down? Here's David Chandler, physics teacher. Just by watching it, anybody can see that building seven fell close to free fall. To measure it, I use software to track the corner of the building and compute a graph of downward velocity as a function of time. The graph had a long straight section indicating constant acceleration. Measuring the slope, I found the acceleration to be within 1% of the acceleration of gravity for the first 2.5 seconds. In other words, the building fell through its own structure with zero resistance. Wait, how does that happen? I mean, this is pretty extraordinary. Let's go to a structural engineer. This building had 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system, and that is intended to keep it from going anywhere. NIST is telling us that the building below it ceased to exist uh, for the first few seconds of the collapse of the building. Well, things in physics just don't cease to exist and cease to resist the forces that are on them. The building didn't disappear so the building can fall for 100 feet at free fall speed. That's impossible. That's a, a violation of, of the fundamental law of physics that says that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, goodness. Um, NIST finally, having been publicly embarrassed in their own press conference by members of AE911 Truth who were saying that this is easily measurable. How can you deny that this building came down at freefall? Which they were doing. They actually denied it. They, they said, well, if, if it came down at freefall, that would mean there'd be no structure there. So they had an elaborate scheme to, to hide this fact, but they were forced into acknowledging it, that it did come down in free fall, given this straight uh, section of this curve here. 
Uh, and uh, they, they said, well, yeah, it came down in free fall, right? In fact, for 100 feet. That's a third of the building's seven second fall. But they don't acknowledge what the implications of that are, that there would be no structure, which they had acknowledged earlier. Where did the structure go? Well, we're going to find out because the, it's been totally dismembered and reduced. I mean, we're talking about a 47-story steel frame moment-resisting structure where the columns and beams are rigidly welded to each other, falling into a pile four, maybe six stories tall, like a house of cards. We have the almost total dismemberment of the steel frame. Remember, buildings that fall naturally, you don't have the columns and beams uh, dissociating from one another, allowing them to fall like a house of cards. Feature number six, limited damage to adjacent structures. Yeah, pretty limited. Um, the, the Verizon building, the post office are slightly damaged, but the center of this building is in the center of the pile. Do we have witnesses that hear sounds of explosions? Well, let's go back to the official story first. We did not find any evidence that explosives were used in the collapse of Building 7. We ran down detailed computer simulations of blast scenarios. This size blast would have produced an incredibly loud sound that was not recorded on videos of the collapse, nor reported by witnesses. No? Well, let's listen to a few witnesses. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the, uh, the bottom floors of the building were on fire and uh you know we heard this this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder turned around we were shocked to see that the building was uh, uh well it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh busted out then you know and then uh you know about a second later the bottom floor caves out and uh, the building followed after that and um a shock wave ripping through the building, a sound of a clap of thunder, windows busting out, and the bottom floor caving out. Wow. How about this Air Force medic, Kevin McPadden, who was uh, on site? And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions. Like, ba boom! It has like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 boom. Like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was ba boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. And this gentleman. I'm going to call in Bill Rosati. He was here when it all happened. He saw it for himself. Bill, if you can just tell us what uh, you saw, what you heard. Uh, I was standing like two blocks away, and uh, all of a sudden, I just seen a big flash, and then I seen the building coming down, and I just seen people just running everywhere, chaotic like. And this gentleman, Barry, Barry Jennings, who, there we go, uh, who, um, along with Mayor Giuliani's attorney Michael Hess, was recording. Excuse me. What was? Uh, it had gone into this building after it was evacuated, which was after the planes hit, but before the towers came down. So he's experiencing all of this inside Building 7. When we got to the eighth floor, I started walking to one side of the building. That side of the building was gone. The first explosion I heard when I was on the stairwell landing, when we made it down to the sixth floor. Then we made it back to the eighth floor. I heard some more explosions. You know, also the sound, like a boom, like a, like an explosion. More than one. Yes. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. When we get outside, the police officer comes to me and says, "You have to run. We have more information of bombs, so you have to run." What bombs, bombs in the building, like this one heard in the. Late morning of 9-11. Yeah, here's one of the guys. He can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, oh. you, you call your mother or something? Oh, oh, you right gotta get back. Yeah. Well, those bombs were picked up uh, 
20 miles away at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Seismic waves uh, were produced. Um, and according to NIST, uh, these were uh, uh, produced by the collapse of this building. But something else happens to cause that to come into question, and that's this 0.6 magnitude event, according to Andre Rousseau, who in 2009 wrote a paper where explosives the source of the seismic signals. He's an applied geophysics expert, author of more than 50 peer-reviewed papers. Um, he notes that the, the peak seismic signal uh, occurs at 520, okay. Uh, but the building doesn't collapse for another 10 seconds. So how can the collapse of the building cause the seismic signal 10 seconds earlier? Well, NIST has an answer for this. A seismic signal 10 seconds prior, uh, likely due to the falling of debris from the interior of the building. Um, so wait a minute. The falling of debris on the inside first. Well, uh, the building, uh, there's there's no evidence of falling debris on the inside. Or we'd see massive crumpling on the outside. Uh, not till uh, a second before the whole thing comes down do we see the interior of the structure uh, really collapsing uh, the core columns underneath the main penthouse and screen wall. So, so uh, no, it can't be that. Uh, so, so what is it? Andre Rousseau says uh, the bell-like form points to an impulsive source of energy, not percussion on the ground, due to the falling of debris. Seismic waves are only cre only created by brief impulses. Low frequencies are associated. Uh, undeniably, these have an explosive origin. So that's extremely important information. Wave velocities and frequency velocities also are easily explained if these are created by strong explosives, these seismic waves. Well, that's fascinating uh, for further study for you, but let's move on to feature number eight. What do we have here with regard to pyroclastic light clouds? Well, the National Fire Protection Association 921, the guide for fire and explosion investigations, is generally accepted as the authority in the field of fire and explosion investigations. Um, used uh, by countries around the world. They say, look for large volumes of gas and the large amount of heat released in chemical explosions, causing rapidly expanding plumes of hot gases. Well, are these observed? Uh, let's take a look at the videos. Racing away from Building 7's collapse in every direction at 35 miles an hour are these incredibly hot, uh, you can tell they're hot by the, by the cauliflower-shaped plumes that the NFPA 921 was just talking about. Um, it's it's actually uh, quite clear. There's a lot more heat in there than these small scattered fires could possibly produce. More heat uh, on the order of something like this, perhaps. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, but let's move on and look for the persistent and extreme heat uh, here. Uh, and what would be the cause of that? Uh, it's documented very well by uh, infrared sensitive cameras from NASA flights. The thermal maps show 1,340 degrees. That is hotter than the hottest office fire, and it is on the surface of Building 7. So wait, there's no fire on the surface of the pile after the collapse of this building, as you've seen. So. What are we measuring here? We're measuring the heat that is escaped from deep down at underneath the pile, which is cooled off. And by the time it reaches the surface, it's only 1,340 degrees. Let's listen to Abel Haas and Astani Ozel, structural engineer that had full access to the Fresh Kills landfill. I saw I'm melting of girders in World Trade Center. Wait a minute. You don't melt girders unless you have heat that's 2,800 degrees. These are the girders he's talking about. 
And this is a piece of World Trade Center 7. So how does steel get melted? 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. How hot are office fires? Well, those office fires that you saw are more likely five or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Not even four, a fourth of what could be melting steel. But the FEMA report himself, Jonathan Barnett, says steel members in the debris pile that appear to have been partly evaporated in extraordinarily high temperatures. How do you evaporate steel? This takes 4,000 degrees to evaporate steel. That is more than six or seven or eight times the temperatures that these fires could have been. And here it is documented by FEMA in their metallurgical examination, which documents never before observed in building fires, eutectic reactions causing intergranular melting, turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, like you see here. So here, another piece of bu Building 7 steel melted, evaporated, Swiss cheese, rapid oxidation, sulfidation, they say, liquid iron, that's molten iron, that's 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit again, with sulfur forming during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. Perhaps the deepest mystery uncovered in the investigation, says the New York Times, this sulfidation, oxidation, liquid iron. And yet, it was completely removed from the reports by NIST, and it doesn't survive this information. This entire chapter, this Appendix C of the FEMA report was thrown out by NIST. What does NIST say? Well, we couldn't get any steel from Building 7. No steel was recovered. Steel is not recovered. Uh, couldn't do tests on the steel. No metallography could be carried out. Well, is that true? Because here is the lead project engineer, the co-project the co engineer, John Gross, on the pile, securing the very piece of steel called a coupon in the industry that was given to FEMA to document the Swiss cheese appearance, which you see right in front of you. Which takes, how, how do you even get that to happen? Well, hydrocarbons, which is buildings and even jet fuel, by the way, which wasn't applicable at Building 7. But they only burn 600 to 1400 degrees. Yet steel and iron had definitely melted during the event, as you see here. We can tell by the color of this material what its temperature is. We're exceeding 2,500 degrees here. Office fires don't burn that hot. 500, maybe 1,000 degrees, as NIST claims. But that's still less than a third for what's required to melt steel. What can cause the steel to melt? Well, let's go to our feature number 10, forensic evidence of what? Thermite? Could thermite have produced all that molten metal? What is thermite anyway? An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Well, maybe we're getting somewhere here. If thermate were used, it would explain the incredibly hot temperatures, 4,000 degrees. It would explain the presence of molten iron, which is the byproduct of thermite, thermate. 
uh, we haven't used, by the way, iron in our skyscraper steel for, well, it's in the steel, but it's not the major component. It is the major component of the steel, but this is elemental iron that, that we're going to find that has been found here. Uh, liquid molten iron, uh, not steel. Uh, and it would explain the sulfur present in the residue, which is added to thermite to become thermate. Fascinating. But do we have evidence of thermite, thermite itself? Uh, the National Fire Protection Guide 921 also says uh, uh, unusual residues that could arise from thermite. Uh, NIST says they found no corroborating evidence to suggest that explosives were used. Later, a year later, when pressed, they finally write, NIST did not test for the presence of explosive residue. Wait, you can't find what you're unwilling to look for. And it's disingenuous at best to say that you didn't find something when you never looked for it. Others did, though. In fact, it wasn't that hard to find Stephen Jones's uh, one of them, a nuclear physicist, formerly from Brigham Young University, he sent a sample of the uh, slag from this beam uh, and uh, at the International Peace Park, which, by the way, is uh, highly um, impacted, not in a, uh, a, a, a straight cut like you see here, the oxyacetylene torches and the thermal lances at uh, the World Trade Center, do not produce this kind of uh, wandering uh, path of destruction uh, and liquid molten slag with aluminum uh, on it. Uh, no, that is produced um, by something else, as you see also on this beam here. But he does a X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy on the slag and finds that uh, it has a liquid molten iron. Uh, not steel, uh, manganese, a direct indicator of thermite, and um, uh, aluminum, and sulfur, a direct indicator of thermate, a special form of thermite. So uh, we have uh, direct evidence there of, of thermite residue in the pile. I wonder, but what did the U.S. Geological Survey find uh, in their toxicological studies documented in their particle atlas of all the World Trade Center dust samples, they find billions of these previously molten iron microspheres. Very well documented. This is elemental iron, again, not steel. So where does this come from? Uh, up to 6% of these dust samples are uh, found um, to uh, be, be previously molten iron microspheres. It's up to 10 tons by extrapolation. Uh, an incredible quantity. In fact, um, this is 150 times the background value of common iron particles that are found in dust. But they're not round, as you see here on the left, uh, iron particle. But these are spherical particles indicating that they were formed in extremely hot temperatures, according to the RJ Lee group, evidence and frequency of heat affected particulates, which they say are formed during the event, not before by the welders who are putting up the, the, the building, not after by the iron workers who are taking it apart. Uh, fascinating. In fact, there are so many of these that they're used as a signature component. It's, it's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has these previously molten iron microspheres in it. Uh, so that's pretty profound. Well, how would they be formed? Let's see. In a controlled experiment here, just in this small experiment, slowing it down halfway, you see thousands of what look like sparks, uh, but they are iron particles, molten iron spheres. Now that's how they get formed. Could that explain, by the way, the toasting of the tops of these cars surrounding the World Trade Center? What else could explain the toasting of the tops of all of these cars from the collapse of three buildings. Think about it. You can make thermite devices in your backyard, shaped cutter charges, as John Cole, civil engineer, did 
in Florida, um, cuts right through steel. In fact, here's a provision. And almost cleanly through that piece of steel, as you've seen. Well, you can also get more efficient cutter, shaped cutter charges, which are designed to be used with thermite. They're much more expensive. Uh, this one issues a particle stream of iron in hundreds of milliseconds. Very effective at cutting through much more, much thicker sections of steel as we had in these buildings. In fact, these devices, uh, this one an igniter, but uh, they can be built with, made by um, or of consolidated thermite. In fact, which would leave nothing behind but a pool of molten iron. So you don't have all these uh, devices left behind, just molten iron, which we're going to be seeing plenty of examples of. But what else was found in the World Trade Center dust? Uh, we have this dust from river to river across lower Manhattan, powdered concrete, uh, 90,000 tons of it, at least. And uh, seven samples were collected and sent uh, to, independently, uh, sent to the this team of scientists led by Niels Herod in Copenhagen, including uh, Jeanette McKinley's apartment, which was across the street from the World Trade Center, her windows blew in. And when the when the Trade Center went down from all the explosives there, which we'll be looking at, by the way, next week in this webinar series, uh, what they found was these curious red-gray chips, red on one side, gray on the other. And they get real curious about these because they are attracted to a magnet. So they have an iron content. And they thought at first they were paint. Well, they do an analysis on the chemical composition uh, and they find through X-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy, uh, iron and aluminum. Uh, curious, real curious. Uh, they, what are the ingredients of thermite, which is iron and aluminum powders mixed three quarter to one quarter doing in all of these chips. So they zoom into this red layer 50,000 times, and they find nano sized particles of iron oxide and aluminum powder. Uh, they're a thousand times smaller than the diameter of human hair. Very, very sophisticated materials, and set in this bed of oxygen, silica, carbon. Uh, this is organic material which is responsible for the concussive force associated with TNT. So here you have an, an incendiary, which works by means of heat, uh, uh, co-engineered with a, an explosive, which is, works by th knocking things over through the expansion of the carbon material. In fact, uh, when this is heated up, these chips uh, at about 420 degrees centigrade, 758 or so Fahrenheit, uh, they ignite and produce spheres the with the same chemical signature of the molten iron microspheres that we've already looked at that were found in the dust by rj lee and the usgs and documented so we know where these spheres came from it's like not a mystery it's proven scientifically in the lab and as if we didn't know where these came from they're found attached to partially ignited red-gray chips, as you see here and here. It's a very sophisticated process. When you reduce the size of these materials down to the nanoscale, you increase the surface volume exponentially, causing uh, a, a much quicker chemical reactions. So you've engineered a, an incendiary to become more explosive. It's, a, it's not made in a cave in Afghanistan. These are this is material is made only in the most advanced defense contracting laboratories. So it has a signature that can be followed uh, if it can be brought into uh, an appropriate uh, justice venue that's not corrupt. 
So this is all documented in the 20 page, 25 page peer reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. You can Google it and read it. So it's very, very powerful and persuasive uh, forensic testimony here, which is part of the 10 features of uh, amounting to direct evidence of destruction with explosives, in this case, incendiaries, uh, none of which is produced by fire. Again, fires cause less robust structures to collapse, uh, but only asymmetrically of gradual deformations following the path of least resistance, and they don't have all this forensic evidence that amounts to incendiaries in them. By the way, why do fires uh, cause uh, uh, have never brought down a skyscraper. Well, the steel conducts the heat away from the source of that flame, uh, uh, that uh, heat. Um, uh, and it, it's because it's extremely uh, dense. So even when you don't have fireproofing, you have the steel uh, uh, protected just by its very nature until it gets about 1200 degrees Fahrenheit which is a critical temperature at which steel can lose half of its strength. But most office fires never get to be 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. But even when they do, and even when the steel is not protected, as we saw, the steel can sag. And generally, it does not fail altogether. Uh, cementitious fireproofing, though, is put on these steel frames to keep that from ever happening. And we're talking about two and three hour fire protection on the, on the beams and columns. And so this is far more protection than necessary in high rises because office buildings only have about 20 or 30 minutes of fuel to burn in a given area. So this is why we never lost a skyscraper before 9-11. And even then we uh, keep the buildings uh, from uh, having combustible materials in them. We build them out of non-combustibles. We don't allow tenants to bring in a lot of combustibles. And um, that's a, a, a followed up with sprinklers, just in case all of that becomes a, we have a fire, we, we the automatic sprinklers uh, will put it out, keeping it from ever becoming a problem. So this is why we don't have fires bringing down skyscrapers. Not even this one, uh, a mid-rise building. Uh, did it uh, collapse? This is building five in the World Trade Center, completely engulfed in fire, right? Well, no. Mid-rise and high-rise fireproofed skyscrapers are not brought down by fire. Not these fires, certainly, which are said to have brought this building down in six and a half seconds for the first time ever. Not buying it. How about the data from the FEMA and NIST reports? Let's look at it. 2002, we had the FEMA report $600,000 worth of funding, but even the New York Times documents that they had bureaucratic restrictions, uh, keeping the engineers from interviewing witnesses, getting access to blueprints of the buildings, forensic inspections, getting crucial information, uh, letting them appeal to the public for photographs. Uh, they, their hands were just tied. Finally, NIST uh, takes over in 2008. NIST is... Uh, they stated, started with a stated conclusion that fires caused the collapse. They weren't looking uh, for anything else other than to justify or try to justify uh, that fires brought this building down. Truthfully, they say, we had trouble getting a handle on Building 7. Yeah, we agree. Uh, and uh, further research, investigation, and analysis are needed to resolve the issue of how this building came down. That's the conclusion of FEMA. Well, uh, we, we do agree um, that this has never been resolved by official sources, the government or the media or our legislators. And that's why we're looking at all the evidence, including the destruction of evidence at the crime scene. I mean, these are easily the largest and most perplexing structural failures in history. And yet, starting just two weeks after 9-11, we have 400 truckloads a day moving this material, starting with Building 7. Uh, 
and, and effectively scrubbing the site. It's the illegal destruction of evidence in a crime scene. These were put on barges sent to China for recycling. Before investigators could get their hands on it, prompting Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering Magazine, to cry out, crucial evidence that could answer many questions is on the slow boat to China, showing an astounding ignorance of government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. But it didn't. And so we go to the experts, like this one one of the top European controlled demolition experts. Danny Joenko is the expert on this in Europe. What did he say? This is controlled demolition. Zeker weten, zeker weten. Er is nasprongen. Dit is in opdracht gebeurd. Het heeft een team gedaan van experts. And this person, uh, the structural engineer of from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. In my opinion, the building, World Trade Center 7, was with great probability professionally demolished. And this engineer, a localized failure in a steel frame building like Building 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous and patterned loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. How about foreknowledge of this building's collapse? Well, here's an engineer that predicts the collapse. Uh, he says, uh, he's asked, uh, how, how soon could we, if we allowed it to burn, could we anticipate a collapse? Now, mind you, a collapse has never happened before in history. So this engineer is saying, well, that's pretty much, uh, uh, he says, uh, you have about five hours. Pretty much right on the money, says Chief Hayden. Gosh, as if it's ever happened before and any engineer could possibly. Well, wait a minute. What's the name of this engineer? <laughs> they won't release it. This is some anonymous engineer. So this prediction could only have been made with foreknowledge. As these statements as well from these mysterious construction workers walking away from Building 7, hearing an explosion over their shoulder, looking back at Building 7, and then looking straight into the CNN camera and saying this. Oh, you hear that? Keep your eye on that building. It's coming down. Moving. It's about to blow up. Moving back. Moving back here. All right, guys. Sorry. We are walking back. There's a building about to blow up. Don't flame. The building is about to blow up, flame and debris coming down. How do they know the building that has a few small scattered fires is about to blow up? They go in buildings all the time to put them out. They don't blow up on them. How about this gentleman? Kevin McPadden, we heard from earlier talking about explosions. Well, before that, he and others around him were held back from Building 7 about seven blocks and behind the yellow tape and he's listening to a radio held in the hands of a red cross worker this is what he hears at the last few seconds he took his hand off and you heard three two one do fires bring buildings down to countdowns what is going on here completely bizarre how about the bbc which announces the collapse of this building 20 minutes before it even happened. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened. Uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? Well, only really what you already know. Details are very, very sketchy. Very sketchy indeed. Uh, how, how can you pre 
how can you announce the collapse of a building even before it happens? Uh, this was also done by CNN. Take a look. In New York, Alan Dodds Frank joins us on the phone uh, in Lower Manhattan. Alan. Alan, uh, just a. Uh... Two or three minutes ago, there was yet another uh, collapse or explosion. I'm now out of sight. A good Samaritan has taken me in on Duane Street. But at a quarter to 11, there was another collapse or explosion following the 1030 collapse of the second tower. And a firefighter who rushed by us estimated that 50 stories went down. Um, the street yeah. filled with smoke. It was like a fire, uh, forest fire roaring down a canyon. A 50-story building went down? There was no other 50-story building that went down. This is about 15 minutes after the towers, the last tower went down. There's, there's, um, there's no other. But there's some buildings that were partially damaged. Uh, if this building had gone down at that time, we wouldn't even have videos of it, which many researchers on this building suggest was the intent which is speculation, but it's interesting because uh, we wouldn't have videos because of the massive dust clouds that were released when the Twin Towers went down. So many people suggest that it was supposed to go down at that time and that these mysterious construction workers that we saw were fixing uh, in the building a dud. It didn't go off. Uh, and... Uh, because of those explosions that we saw earlier uh, documented by Barry Jennings and uh, before he retracted his statement, uh, Michael Hess, the attorney of Mayor Giuliani. So um, uh, a fascinating series of events here. Uh, these dust tech clouds uh, would uh, almost completely obscure Building 7. Um, so leading us to the owner of Building 7, who built it in the in the late eighties? Uh, Larry Silverstein uh, interviewed on PBS in October. Listen to this. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander, telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull, and then we watched the building collapse. So they made the decision to pull it, and then we watched the building collapse. Uh, wait a minute. You don't pull a building in an afternoon or on a, I mean, it takes months to, to engineer a building. A pull it is a term used in the controlled demolition industry. Well, and the firefighters weren't even attempting to fight the fires, according to FEMA. Uh, they were concerned about structural damage, is what they were told. So they went in and looked at the building fires, or got examined them as close as they could, I guess. But they were ordered out of the building. No manual firefighting operations were taken by FDNY. No firefighting. Well, that's why we use the scientific method. And when we do, we come up with hypotheses that are supported by the data. Which one to you is supported by the data? I'll leave that in your capable hands. Uh, but uh, we believe we've shown 10 key characteristic features and some uncharacteristic features, i.e. thermite, uh, used to bring down Building 7. Uh, direct evidence of destruction with explosives, fire not being able to create any one of these with additional circumstantial and corroborative testimony. We believe that this is proof of controlled demolition. And so uh, we want to give you the opportunity to ask your questions at this time. Andy, how do they do that? Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, so at this time, please submit any questions that you might have in the same input form, uh, and we will do our best to answer them. They're right on our website. In the meantime, we'll tell you about some of the ways that you can get involved if now that you're informed, you agree that this evidence is quite compelling and warrants a new investigation. Well, cool. And uh, you can also subscribe to our uh bulletins, or the latest evidence we're coming out with, the, the, the release of the 
of the World Trade Center 7 Holsey Report is coming uh, very soon. Uh, stay on top of that. And um, we also want you to get informed uh, on our website. We have an incredible amount of evidence. Um, so look at, look at it there. Sign the petition. Join 3,150 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. Support them. Uh, there's 20,000 others who will support them. So you can sign that petition too, if you will. We'd appreciate it. Um, and also, we're asking you to support our organization with a donation. And uh, you can do that on our website as well. Uh, we have a staff of half a dozen uh, part time and full time staff, and we are all over the place, especially this September. And we need your support. We have a, a large fundraising project to get the study out to 25,000 20, engineers uh, across the country and even around the world. Um, we have to go to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Washington, D.C., with the fire commissioners from the Munson Fire District, who have unanimously voted for a resolution calling for a new investigation of 9-11 based on the evidence that you've just been looking at. So an extraordinary development in the 9-11 truth community. And uh, we're bringing them to the National Press Club on September 11th at 9.30 in the morning. So don't miss that. And uh, get the latest details by subscribing, but support us. Um, this is an incredible uh, effort to mail uh, cards about the study to 20,000 engineers to bring Professor Halsey to New York, excuse me, to, uh, to, to Berkeley on September uh, 5th uh, for a presentation and to bring ourselves to New York, where we also have another uh, exciting development, which is the... Uh, Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry hosting a conference in New York with uh, Bill Binney will be there this year. And uh, and most likely Mark Crispin Miller, myself, the, the fire district commissioners who voted for this resolution. Very exciting uh, September, full of activities. We're bringing the commissioners also down to Congress. We're going to be asking you to make an appointment with your congressperson and we will go uh, with you or without you. Uh, very exciting uh, opportunities. So it, it all takes uh, funds. So please, a minimum of $25 one time, $25 a month, even better. And you can do better than that if you're capable. Uh, everybody can help in their, at their own level. Become a member of AE911 Truth. And become a sustaining member. Uh, join the family of those who give regularly to support the work that we do, to take all the actions that we take. And it takes a lot of volunteers, doesn't it, Andy? Yes, it does. Those 20,000 engineers that uh, the report is going to be going out to, I mean, they had to be found. Those people had to be found. They had to be compiled. And it's not just that work. It's so much else. It's all of our great activists out there reaching out to the media, college stations, corporate media, radio stations, alternative media, uh, trying to get Richard on the air to talk about the study and all the great stuff that he was just talking about coming up on the 11th. Uh, so much more, too numerous to list. So if you want to be a part of this and you got a few hours a week, then you got to go to ae911truth.org. There's a very simple tab on there to volunteer, a very simple application. We'll get in touch with you, uh, find out where you'll best fit, and uh, just a few hours a week really do go a long way and help us with our mission. So if you have the time, then be part of history and, and give that time. Beautiful. And it it, it uh, you can see we're, we're in all of the conferences all around the United States. So you can support us when we come to your town and uh, try to educate the architects and engineers now through Project Due Diligence. So here's all our teams that you can talk to Andy about. And uh, we also want you to go reach out locally to elected representatives, television, radio, newspaper, um, Tell everyone you know. Screen the AE 911 Truth DVDs. Share the brochures one on one. Uh, they're all located in our store, which is at AE 911 Truth.org. Um, and uh, just know about and support financially the World Trade Center 7 evaluation.org. Uh, this is the four year, $300,000 study by the professor, uh, uh, Leroy Halsey. 
I'm one of the top forensic structural engineers in the country. And we talked a little bit earlier about what he's doing. Uh, but this study is coming out in uh, on September 4th, it will be released. And uh, he has proven conclusively the fire didn't bring this building down, which is why we're going to Congress with the Bobby McElvain Act. What about that, Andy? Absolutely. Sorry, I had some trouble getting off mute there, but there it is, the Bobby McElvain Act. We introduced it a few years ago, and we're still going strong with it. We're going to be heightening our efforts in the aftermath of the release of this Building 7 study that we've all been waiting for. This is the path to justice for the nearly 3,000 victims who died on September 11th. It's named after Bobby McElvain. He was killed as he was entering the North Tower that morning. Uh, so it was killed by an explosion. So of course, how he died puts into question the official story. And his father has worked with us for years. What this would do is it would create a select committee. It can be passed in either House of Congress to do exactly what we've been asking Congress to do for years, to do their jobs, really, and look into the evidence of explosive demolition at all three World Trade Center towers. The, the act is actually written in such a way that they have to look into the possibility that explosives were used and, and that nanothermite was utilized. Uh, you can learn more about it by going to ae911truth.org forward slash justice. On that page, you can download a copy of the act. You can download a letter from Richard, a letter from Bob McElvain, put them all together in a packet. You can do what I have one volunteer doing. He's going to all the presidential candidates right now and presenting it to them and uh, asking them where they stand on it. We got an article up on our website that details that. Uh, you can do that. You can go to your members of Congress. Uh, if you don't have time to actually go out and shake their hand and hand them the paper, you can write to them. We have a form. The letter's already written for you. You simply just uh, fill it out with your address information and it will go. And if you want to keep up on what's going on whenever we have mass actions, you can go text 79, or I'm sorry, text 911 Justice to 797979 and you'll be put on that list and activated when we have uh, these, these massive outreaches throughout the country. Um, so there is that. And I just want to inform Richard that I'm no longer seeing a slide up on the screen. So uh, we might want to get that up for the. For the, before the next one comes up. How's that? that Perfect. Back up now? Okay. Perfect. Uh, I don't know what happens uh, to that. Uh, anyway, uh, this is all exciting, as if, as if that's not enough. All the progress we're making in the 9-11 truth movement is highlighted by the grand jury investigation, which, is been, which has been promised by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan uh, it, it, to impanel a grand jury. Uh, so uh, this may very well be underway. It's a secret process. Uh, we've given them the petition uh, with all of our evidence on it. Our attorneys have from the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. And uh, now we're about to submit a mandamus action, uh, forcing them to to uh, comply if they haven't already. And that's uh, by the Lawyers Committee uh, for 9-11 Inquiry, which has also submitted on our behalf a a lawsuit against the FBI for refusing, well, for uh, neglecting to uh, submit to Congress uh, in 2015 the evidence for explosive demolition, which they were required to do because they had it, because we gave it to them and they acknowledged having it. Uh, so this is uh, 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 an easy one. Uh, we should uh, have this information publicly given by the FBI to Congress uh, very soon. So. Um, with that in mind, I want you to see the evidence that you, uh, the, the opportunity to share this evidence with others at the easy way the, with our documentary DVD, <clears throat> which is online now for free. But uh, take a look at this uh, quick peek uh, of, of these architects and engineers. I don't want to be involved in conspiracy theories. I, you know, there are lots of them. They can go on. We can speculate on that forever. What we really need to know is how, how those buildings came down. 
World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fire fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. To undermine scientific integrity is to undermine our democracy. This is what NIST has done, denied and ignored crucial evidence. The American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. More than 1,500 architects and engineers and 12,000 others, including many scientists, have signed the petition calling for a scientific investigation of the destruction of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center Building 7. The report, issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, referred to as NIST, was not valid science. They're talking about a single columnar collapse or failure that resulted in a total collapse of the building. Building number seven uh, descended in free fall for the first 100 feet, which uh, means that there was absolutely no resistance to the descent whatsoever. So all of the columns really needed to be severed at the same time. The symmetry is the smoking gun. NIST has admitted it went into free fall for eight stories. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. This is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. What I saw, it was a classic implosion. The center of the core, the penthouse area, starts to move first, and then the building follows along with it. NIST excluded the documents from FEMA in Appendix C that documented the evidence of melting steel. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. There were these iron microspheres present in all of the dust samples. They needed to have been formed in extremely high temperatures. All the characteristics of the microspheres, along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found, tell me that thermite was involved. In the dust, what we have found is a modern version of thermite, which we call nanothermite. NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives <laughs> or residues of explosives. And in fact, the evidence is overwhelming that these red grade crystals are very high temperature incendiaries. And we have watched as scientific integrity has been undermined and scientific research politicized in an effort to advance predetermined ideological agendas. If this is a crime, I think everybody agrees it's a crime. Evidence was removed from the scene of the crime. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. And the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. Uh, this is not science. I highly encourage everyone to watch this film. Just go to YouTube and and Google experts speak out. Uh, it comes up uh, pretty close to the top. Uh, or 9-11 experts speak out. Um, we also have a 50-page booklet on this information destroying the NIST reports of the destruction of these three buildings. And uh, the, uh, the, the two-hour presentation uh, two and a half hour, actually, uh, of uh, of all three buildings in in one presentation. But we'll be getting to that next next week uh, in next week's seminar, Thursday, Twin Towers. Uh, but share this one, which is also free on YouTube, uh, solving the mystery of World Trade Center Seven. Uh, it um, is narrated by Ed Asner, and it's only on Building Seven. It was it's professionally made. PBS. So you can't go wrong uh, sharing that. Um, so at this point, I'm um, guessing we have questions, Andy? Well, there were no questions that came in today. And typically when that happens, it means that there's some problem with our email delivery. Uh, so if you're a regular listener to this webinar or watcher, uh, please uh, let me know, especially when I know who watches. Uh, send me an email and tell me if you submitted a question today. And uh, of course, I didn't read it because I didn't get it. 
Um, but I'm going to ask you a question, Richard. This is one that people still say after all these years. What about those who come out and say that popular mechanics debunked this years ago? Yeah. Well, uh, in chapter seven of the popular mechanics book, they talk about building seven. And guess what? Fortunately for you, the listeners who just heard this uh, information, um, it completely um, deals uh, with this question because popular mechanics simply touts the NIST report. And uh, claiming, as we've shown here, that, oh, this building came down by those massive fires that were burning for hours, seven hours, caused steel to fail, causing the, causing the steel beams to expand and push this girder off of its seat, causing an internal failure on the east side under the east penthouse, which is what caused it to collapse. <clears throat> which gutted the entire inside of this building. And then the exterior falls, as you saw. So we went through, fortunately, and disproved every one of the key points of NIST's collapse initiation theory. Um, and there's just nothing left for popular mechanics to stand on. At one point, the popular mechanics quotes Sham Sunder saying early on, saying that there were diesel fuel fires in this building because there was diesel generators in the building and there was tanks of diesel fuel in a high rise, which was very controversial. But uh, when NIST was disproven uh, by one of our members at AE 911 Truth, who said, hey, the diesel fuel was on the fifth floor. The fifth floor has louvers all around it for that mechanical operation. Those louvers were not issuing any smoke. Uh, and so the NIST was forced into withdrawing the diesel fuel theory, which would have been very convenient for them. So uh, uh, they, they also had to withdraw the earlier quotes that they had made to popular mechanics that there was massive building damage on the south side early on they said this uh, scooping out a quarter of the depth of building seven and none of which is seen in any of the photographs but they made this claim so they withdrew that and finally saying well the damage from these columns that hit the building was only a minor cause of this building's collapse because they needed to justify the early collapse of the east penthouse on the northeast side so they couldn't do that at the same time as focusing on the south side damage so they had to say that the south side damage from the beams was a minor uh, relatively in, not a significant factor in the building's collapse. So they focus on this fire, which they found, and show that it was burning at the time of the collapse, the direct fabrication disputed by the videos and photos, so that they could heat up this area and cause this steel collapse so the east penthouse could fall. And now, a good question is, what did make the East Penthouse fall? Because we proved earlier that it wasn't the column 79 failure because it, would have, it was so obvious that if, if that failure occurred, as they showed in their computer model, in, in reality, it would have crumpled that, that exterior perimeter structural steel system and the granite panels and breaking of windows massively. And none of that was shown. I mean, there's a few windows that are breaking, but nothing like we would have seen in type of collapse that they claim happened. So what did bring down the East Penthouse? Well, um, we can make an assumption here that it was uh, timed explosions that went off at the wrong time. 
Uh, maybe that was one of the the last uh, explosions or shape cutter charges that should have gone off. Uh, that's a, certainly a plausible explanation. Uh, did you have anything else, Sandy, that you remember from uh, popular mechanics that was? Uh, the only other point I'm going to make is I'm going to reference that ten-story gouge that Richard mentioned earlier that NIST ended up having to abandon because there was clearly no evidence of that. One of the fact checkers on Popular Mechanics book that proposes to debunk all of the 9-11 conspiracy theories, Devin Colburn went on a show, the Charles Goethe show, a number of years ago around the time that this book was released. Now, if you are a supporter of the official story, then listening to this interview will make you uncomfortable. However, I find it uh, extremely entertaining because Devin Colburn is completely undone by Charles Goyette. And one of the things that Devin Colburn says is that we, oh, I've seen photos of this 10-story uh, gouge. Uh, then when he was pressed on it, uh, he said that, well, we can't release them. We're the only people allowed to see them, which prompted the host to ask, well, why do you get to see them and I can't see them? Well, it turned out since NIST ended up having to abandon this because the evidence showed there was no 10-story gouge that Devin Colburn was lying. So... Uh, I think in 2019, we're not that surprised by this fact anymore, but when in doubt, when they can't prove the science, they just lie to you. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you look at both sides of this argument. Wow. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks, Andy. That's a, There's so many lies that they make, though. I mean, they, they've dig, dug themselves a hole in the ground. They could never crawl out of, which we have, which is why we haven't heard much from them in years. Um, so, um, they also claim that the fires were 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, as, as if that explains somehow that the, the 2800 degree temperatures and the 4000 degree temperatures, uh, that we have evidence of in building seven, uh, uh, 4000 degrees being the temperature required to evaporate steel. 2,800 degrees being the temperature required to melt steel. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and yet, even so, th claiming 1,100 degree temperatures, th there's no evidence for fires that hot. That's an extremely hot fire. These fires were not hot. They're few, small, and scattered, probably for five or 600 degrees, which is a typical fire uh, temperature for fires of that size. But um, if that's the last question, um, I think we'll just go on and let you know that uh, this was about Building 7, of course, this week. Next week, Thursday, 1 o'clock, we go into the Twin Towers, starting with Part 2, their explosive destruction, where we look at the sudden near freefall collapse of these buildings, the high-velocity lateral ejections, you know, four-ton structural steel sections ejected at, Eight laterally landing 600 feet in every direction, trailed by thick white smoke clouds. The shattering, the complete shattering of each of the structural steel frames, uh, a violation of, uh, of, of any natural collapse theory. Um, and the midair pulverization of concrete, 90,000 tons of concrete. We're going to see that if the steel was distributed outside the footprint of these buildings and the concrete was pulverized to a fine powder and delivered river to river across lower Manhattan. What was left to crush the building? An extraordinary question because this is most of the weight of those buildings. And yet we're told it's a gravitational collapse. So we go in uh, then the week after that, uh, uh, Thursday, one o'clock, part three, to look at the extreme heat, and what could have caused all of this damage uh, with evidence uh, of thermite, nanothermite, given by the iron, previously molten iron microspheres, molten steel, pyroclastic like clouds, and compare those to the high rise fires that uh, were few, uh, were, which were uh, diminished at the time of the collapse. So we'll go into all that later in, in part three. Um, and uh, oops, and, and this was. Uh, part two and uh, not this was part one not three but we'll get to part three uh, bear with us and uh, looking forward to seeing you all then uh, pass the video around like and subscribe we really appreciate 
it when you do that it, it helps the message get out there and we want you to do your part as well uh thanks everybody uh, we'll catch you next week thursday one o'clock